Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening, where, wherever you're at. Um, uh, I'm in the Far East, so it's uh, it's evening here. And, but my colleagues uh, uh, back at CSIS, it's the morning back there. Um, and my colleagues at Stanford, it's early morning there. So, But uh, uh, thank you for coming um, to this very, very, I think, important session. Uh, my name is Scott Roselle. Uh, I'm a co-director with Hongbin Lee of the Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions. This is a joint effort of Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute for National Studies and the Stanford Institute of Economic Policy Research. Uh, the objective of our center is um, uh, to create an impact program that, convey, that conveys policy relevant insights from the best new data driven research to audiences beyond academia to inform important debates about contemporary China and about US-China relations, uh, among other things. Um, uh, besides research and teaching uh, in our research impact group, um, our, our sort of, the, the part of it I like the best, we, we do a lot of things, but is uh, we've started Big Data China, and that's what we're doing here today uh, with, um, Scott Kennedy and and his very very um, uh, resourceful and 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 very informative group, um, Big Data China is a partnership between Sky and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. You guys know him as CSIS. That aims to highlight policy implications of cutting edge scholarly work on China for the DC policy community and the U.S. business community through regular multimedia analyses and events and. Today is uh, another one of one of the most interesting ones that uh, I think we've been put out uh, this year. Um, I'm going to turn you over to Scott now. He's going to inform you a little about what's going to happen today and take it forward, Scott. Okay. Uh, Professor Roselle, wonderful to see you and uh, to have this partnership, Big Data China, uh, with you and your colleagues at Stanford. Uh, and it's wonderful to have everyone joining us uh, today. I'm gonna. I have a, a PowerPoint slide. I'm gonna put up to uh, to to continue on with the conversation here. Um, so uh, today's uh, topic uh, is about China's GDP growth data and potential proxies for measuring the size and direction of China's economy. Um, You've already heard from our collaborator, uh, Scott Roselle. Uh, today, uh, myself and my colleague, Maya May, are, are gonna present uh, research that we've done uh, here at CSIS, trying to understand the debate about Chinese GDP growth data and the search for additional or alternative metrics to understand the trajectory of China's economy. Uh, uh, Mai and I are going to present some of the findings first to, to put the groundwork uh, down for everybody. And then we're going to have commentary from three leading economists on China. Uh, Dan Rosen, who's a partner at the Rhodium Group, uh, as well as a senior associate at CSIS in our program. Ann Stevenson Yang, who's managing principal at J Capital Research. And Yao Yang, who's the dean of the National School of Development at Peking University. Uh, the big question that people often ask about Chinese GDP growth data is, can you rely on it? Uh, the data that I've got on the screen in front of you all right now uh, is both the real numbers, uh, the uh, if you take inflation into account, that's in red, and then the uh, blue line, uh, I'm sorry, the red is nominal, and then the blue line is the real data when you take inflation into account. And those numbers don't look exactly like each other. And a lot of people think that uh, there's a lot of uh, water in those numbers, so to speak, and that for both political reasons and technical reasons, depending on Chinese official data, uh, is not the wisest thing to do if you really want to understand the true trajectory of China's economy. This is something that folks in Washington, D.C. Uh, and other capitals have worried about a lot for a very, very long time, and particularly as China's economy, at least reportedly officially, gets bigger and bigger and potentially approaches 
and may surpass the size of the US, this is of increasing interest to people. So we went out uh, and reviewed the literature, uh, collected some of our own data and interviewed some experts. That literature includes a report uh, that uh, Dan Rosen, who's with us today, co-wrote uh, in 2015 with one of his colleagues from the Rhodium Group called Broken Abacus, uh, which is one of the most detailed uh, analyses of China's GDP data, how it's put together, how to estimate the size of, of China's economy. Uh, Tom Orlick and others have also done this kind of research. So we went back and reviewed uh, the, these studies. Uh, we collected some more data uh, on different elements of the Chinese economy. Uh, and then I think the funnest part of this project uh, that, that Maya May and I did was interviewing uh, 15 uh, economists, uh, including three of whom are with us uh, today. And we asked them about uh, their views about Chinese official data, about alternative potential proxies, about what's what should one do in terms, you know, just day to day trying to understand where China's economy uh, is headed. Um, and we came up with some really interesting findings from them. This group, uh, like all economists, uh, don't agree with each other on everything, uh, but they don't disagree wildly. Uh, there is a weight of opinion in a certain area um, that is that I wasn't expecting. I thought they'd be 100 percent all over the map. Uh, and that there is some variation, but there's more similarities uh, than I expected. And we'll we'll get to that uh, in a little while. So I think this the original source of skepticism about Chinese official data has to do with the political economy of China. I think everyone is familiar uh, who's watching that China's data is assembled and analyzed and presented by the National Bureau of Statistics uh, based in Beijing. Uh, the size of their uh, organization has grown dramatically over time, and so has their technical capabilities. But China's a very large country, a complex economy, uh, and also growth is important politically. And so there are a variety of constraints on the ability of the National Bureau of Statistics to do the job that people think uh, that they should. And so that has been a central concern of, of observers. If you look at the official growth data, which is in red here, and then look at a bunch of other unofficial estimates, you'll see that particularly 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the official data estimates were significantly higher than the unofficial estimates. Over time, some of those unofficial, there's been greater consonance between the official data estimates and other estimates, but not precise. Um, and it's actually really interesting that in 2022, the official number for real GDP growth was lower than just about what everyone expected it to be. Um, but there is still significant skepticism about uh, Chinese data. One of the me measures that people used to raise concerns about Chinese data has to do with provincial officials and local officials and their tendency, the incentives that they have to report high growth numbers. Um, and so if you took uh, the provincial reported GDP growth numbers for each province and added them up and then compared them to the national number, for a long time, you saw a significant gap, which we show here. The yellow number is that provincial average. The blue number is the, what the National uh, Bureau of Statistics reports for the country as a whole. And you can see up until about 2016, there was a significant gap, despite you know that one year in 2007 where they were closely aligned. Now they're quite similar, and the provincial number is actually even a little bit lower uh, than the official number. And maybe that's one indicator that things, that Chinese data collection is getting better, but we're not sure, right? So we went and interviewed uh, these scholars, and we asked them uh, three basic questions about what their views were about the official data, 
about different proxies and about how we ought to proceed and, and what they do to follow China's economy. Give us some guidance and suggestions. And we did find amongst many people that many of these economists significant concerns about Chinese data. Uh, now, there was someone who was the strongest opinion and said, you know, no one thinks it's reliable, Chinese GDP data. Both Chinese GDP number and GDP growth numbers are unreliable. Another said that the GDP data is wildly unreliable and a political figure. And another said that China's official data is particularly bad compared to other developing countries, even Russia and Pakistan that have better data. Local and provincial governments have incentives to overreport their numbers uh, to the central government. These are things that I've already mentioned to you. But I think what we found most surprising in the interviews, uh, let me say uh, some other types of things that people pointed out is in terms of problems, uh, they said that although the National Bureau of Statistics has improved it in how it collects data compared to 10 years ago, there's increasing concerns, increasing concerns about data transparency. And in particular, people are worried about during the COVID period from 20. 20 on, uh, significant incentives to uh, hide data. There's less data available to scholars uh, and that people are concerned that the 2021 and 2022 uh, statistics were particularly inflated. And people in terms of what they point to as most challenging is investment data uh, and housing data, which are two large drivers of growth over the last uh, 30 plus years. The other problem that people pointed to isn't whether or not the numbers are too high or too low, but whether uh, they flatten out and eliminate and hide the volatility that genuinely exists. And so one economist told us when the economy is bad, the NBS tends to inflate the GDP numbers. And when the economy is good, it, they tend to suppress the number. And so it's this smoothing as much as whether the number is too high or too low that give people concern. That said, what we really found particularly interesting in these discussions is how uh, more positive people were about Chinese GDP data than we expected uh, in terms of improvement, not necessarily absolute, the best on the planet, but significant improvement. Uh, one person, said the official Chinese GDP statistics have improved over the years and are now clearly more reliable than any proxy measure I am familiar with. China's GDP number is not highly precise, but is not inaccurate, uh, said another person. Uh, and when asked whether or not the Chinese are really trying to fix the numbers one by one, uh, someone said China doesn't have the skill or effort to massage everything in the data. And they pointed to uh, areas in which data collection and reporting has improved with household consumption and services, international trade. And so in general, people thought, you know, maybe the numbers aren't exactly right, but if you look over time, you get a significant progress compared to where things were. And that official data can be genuinely helpful in, in trying to understand where China's economy is headed. That said, uh, people were not, uh, people still look for alternatives. Uh, and one alternative uh, they look for uh, is the Li Keqiang Index. Uh, Li Keqiang, China's premier, uh, in 2007 or eight, uh, started saying that he himself needed to look at alternative sources of data to try and determine which, where China's economy was going and put together what came to be known as the Li Keqiang Index, which is a combination of data on rail freight volume, industrial electricity usage, and bank loans. Uh, and here you can see the combination of uh, the Li Keqiang Index, which is in green here, along with uh, the official data on real growth in red and nominal GDP growth in blue. And you can see that in certain periods, these numbers look relatively similar, uh, particularly in the last few years. Um, and some places they, they look different. It was in the noughts 
uh, when this was first looked at and people thought this was particularly useful, but you can see some significant gaps uh, and differences. But it's surprising uh, that in the last three years, uh, these numbers look uh, far more similar than one would expect. And maybe that's because to get to address the COVID challenge, that investment in physical uh, in, uh, production, manufacturing, uh, new loans has, has gone up and that may be the biggest source of growth. Nevertheless, we went and we went and asked our uh, economists that we interviewed about the Li Keqiang index. I had to tell you that although we did find some praise for the Li Keqiang index in things that have been written uh, both within China uh, and outside China, um, just about none of our economists that we interviewed thought it was a useful statistic. Um, one said it's useful, but most criticized the Li Keqiang index because they thought it can't be any better than the official GDP data because they're still all coming from the same basic source. And that, as one said, the Li Keqiang index can be manipulated too. People create too much hype of this index. And another person said, as soon as an index becomes popular, they get manipulated such as uh, this. And so I was somewhat surprised that uh, although there's been seen progress in real GDP, in the GDP numbers, there was not a lot of support for the Li Keqiang index. And so that got us thinking about what other potential metrics about China's economy might people look at. And one of the ones that is most interesting that we came across is night lights. And there's been reporting about the use of night lights to analyze economies in other parts of the world. And often that uh, fi finds distortion somewhere around 35% of claimed economic growth. Uh, Maya, my, uh, my, my partner in this project, uh, she went and she got two pictures off of Na from NASA uh, looking uh, at uh, parts of, of China. This is the same place uh, about two weeks apart in uh, on January. A significant reduction in lights uh, in this part of, of China uh, as a result. And, and so this would be a significant sign of reduced economic activity. Uh, and so if if me, if I were reading this, I would say, oh, China's economy slowed down significantly. GDP must have dropped if this is the pattern that would extend for a long period of time. But this is just one view. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand things over uh, to Maya, who's going to show everybody about some of the other uh, metrics uh, data that we collected and how uh, some conclusions that we might uh, draw from some of those. And then we'll go to our commentators uh, and get their opinions. So, so Maya, thanks for collaborating on this project. Uh, let me turn the floor over to you. You just said turn on your, turn on your microphone. Thank you. Hi. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yes. So, um, so this is the one uh, figure where we put um, nominal GDP and other growth metrics side by side. And um, so I'm starting with the nominal GDP year over year growth rate, and then I will compare the quarterly, quarterly nominal GDP with three groups of other growth metrics to give everybody a sense of the relationship between those metrics and how you can play around with this figure when our feature seven comes out um, very soon after this event. Uh, so, and then there's an interactive figure so everybody can try. So in general, there are two kinds of metrics, um, physical and sentiment. Physical metrics cover uh, all the manufacturing, services and trade, et cetera, whereas sentiment metrics reflect people's uh, opinion. They're both based on scientific data, but they measure economic activity and performance differently. So for the first group, we we'll start with comparing nominal GDP with the uh, official manufacturing PMI, can scroll down a menu here, uh, as well as official um, service PMI. So PMI is Purchasing Manager Index. 
It provides monthly indications of economic activities through serving hundreds of companies in China about their purchasing activities and supply situations. So when we put those lines together, we can see that despite PMIs have more volatility since it's a higher frequency uh, index, the general trend is very similar to the official nominal GDP until the COVID era, when you can see a big jump, a big drop in early 2020, and then a big jump in early 2021. This can help us understand why some people um, criticize official GDP data so much, since it is unbelievably smooth when other metrics like PMIs, uh, what you can see in this figure, show extreme fluctuations. Now let's move on to um, the second group of comparison. So we'll start with nominal GDP again, and this time I'll add on uh, electricity consumptions and real estate investment. So again, these two um, metrics show more volatility than the uh, official nominal GDP, and their trends were not really aligned with nominal GDP until COVID era, where the three lines were moving in the same direction with very similar trends. So. So far, what we're seeing are actually um, two possible stories or explanations. So if you're confident at the quality and accuracy of the official GDP growth number, you could draw the conclusion saying that those alternative metrics can be added up to form the nominal GDP growth line, which is generally in the middle. But if you're not that confident at the official nominal GDP growth data, the conclusion you can reach uh, you'll reach by reviewing those alternative growth metrics is that they show a more nuanced picture where different parts of the economy are actually moving in different directions. So both can be correct. Uh, it depends on how you choose to view this subject. And now let's move on to um, group three, where I'll show you an outlier. Uh, let's put nominal GDP next to uh, auto mobile sales. Here. So a lot of people believe that car sales reflect how well the economy is doing, but when we actually put it um, next to GDP growth line, the two lines are very different, as you can see. Um, I'm not saying that one of them um, is false or fake data, but you just have to make a decision on how you choose to interpret them when you have so many different metrics you can look at. So again, it is best to review a broad range of growth metrics instead of just relying on one single index or proxy when you're trying to interpret China's economy or making any important business decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, Maya, really appreciate that. Let me um, put my screen back up and go to one last uh, slide before we go to our uh, expert panel for, for their, their take. Um, and let me just, uh, so some takeaways from, from the work that Maya and I have done uh, based on interviewing uh, these economists, including the three that are with us. The first is don't obsess about China's GDP data. It is important, uh, but it is not absolutely important. And if you focus on the precision as opposed to the trend, you, you might get uh, uh, distracted from really what the value of GDP data is. And um, this is, in, in some ways, China is, is not unique about some of the challenges that it faces with, with GDP data. The second is that you need to collect and examine other quantitative data beside GDP growth data, like the ones that that Maya just showed you, and that we'll have in the presentation in the feature when it comes out in the next few days. These aren't necessarily proxies of GDP growth, but they are gr more granular views into different components of the economy, which may be, in fact, more useful for uh, observers. Lastly, although uh, we're all uh, data geeks and nerds, and we like numbers. Qualitative data, observation is highly valuable. Going to China, to different parts of China, to Western China, rural China, to second, third, fourth tier cities, the coast, to factories, to stores, uh, observing in a systematic way, not just randomly going around, but systematic qualitative observation can tell you a lot that the 
numbers just reported on the screen from official authorities can't necessarily tell you. So not only should you not overly worry about the GDP number, you also need to collect other types of quantitative data. And you need to, in addition, supplement that with looking at what China feels like on the ground, which we now can do uh, because, uh, you know, we're now traveling. And in fact, uh, several of us who are on the uh, will be traveling to China uh, next week uh, for doing some of this work. So let me now turn the floor over to our three commentators and, and get their take on this subject. We're going to start with uh, Dan Rosen uh, from the Rhodium Group, uh, who's done some amazing work on China's GDP data, um, amongst everything else. And then we'll turn to Ann Stevenson Young, who is my go to person and has been for decades on trying to understand what China's economy really feels like tangibly uh, that you don't see always in the official data. And then we're going to go to Yao Yang, who's one of China's most authoritative economists as dean of the National School of Development, uh, to get his assessment about uh, where we're going. I'm not going to ask you all any specific questions. I'm going to let you take the ball wherever, in whatever direction you all would like to go uh, for you know five, six minutes each. And then we'll come back and we'll have a group discussion uh, with, with everybody on the screen at the same time. So uh, Dan Rosen, over to you. Thank you, Scott. And um, it's great to um, be together with this group to talk about China GDP uh, questions, um, a perennial topic of interest to economists and businesses and um, I dare say policymakers nowadays as well. Now, let me just offer an overarching comment to begin. You know, throughout, I think, all of our careers, call it three decades or maybe a little more than three in, in some of our cases, um, the, the nuances, the details, like they were really interesting to us. But fundamentally, the sort of direction and magnitude of China's growth didn't need a, a number, right? Like everybody knew that this was a giant and growing chunk of marginal global growth and almost every industry, right? Uh, you know, um, whether you could put a finer point on it was really important to us as researchers, but it was, you know, obvious enough that this was a a huge amount of growth was taking place, right? Bigger than, than most companies could imagine really addressing that market. Today, for the first time in essentially 40 or 50 years, that is no longer a reliable assumption, right? Um, growth may be slowing so much that in certainly already in many industries, it's negative, it's contractionary. Um, and the sort of we can't just count on it being big and we're not sure how big. And so just throw everything you got at it. That is not, that has worked more than it hasn't worked in the past. It doesn't work from this point going forward. And, you know, to some extent that is a, uh, a result of China having gotten to middle income level where fast growth rates normally slow down, right? Um, but we also are concerned looking in the rear view mirror of the past 10 years and what that tells us about the policy capacity of leadership in China to manage their way going forward and through the middle income trap uh, uh, period. Without reliable ability to do GDP analysis, policy will have a harder time. Policy makers will have a harder time and business decision makers have a harder time uh, say, you know, uh, continuing to devote so much time to uh, to China. Um, we know, I mean, what we learned, R Rhodium and working with CSIS in the past and the broken abacus study that Scott mentioned is that the National Bureau of Statistics did or does understand what is required to do good national income accounting analysis of GDP. It's not a question of, well, we have to learn how to do this. They learned, they understand very well. And when we looked at pre-2014 data, uh, uh, official Chinese data, it actually gave us a very accurate count 
of what the level of China's GDP growth was, looking back to, I think, 2013, 2012, 2013, 2014 period, if I remember correctly, what we were looking at, right? If any, anything, it understated the size of the Chinese economy a little bit because it understated how big the property bubble had been even in those years, right? It imputed rent for pro uh, how we value the property sector, for example. I mean, if we, if China had recognized how much even bigger property bubble had been in those years, it would have been even more concerned about slowing down the property sector before it became a problem too big to solve, <laughs> which is kind of the story that we're living through right now, uh, in my opinion. That's number one. So, but while we know that they understood how to do this analysis, I think we also have to say with certainty that their ability as statisticians and economists to do that work uh, was hampered by political uh, uh, pressures in the years that followed that. When my colleagues and I, uh, Logan Wright in particular, have looked at GDP growth 2014 to 2019 and the stability uh, in, in those lines with both, both Scott and Maya noted, it just doesn't make any statistical sense whatsoever. Everyone in the world who does statistics, understands statistics and math, knows that it was ridiculous what was being reported, the stability of growth. And uh, Chinese officials have never engaged in a, in a reasonable discussion about those problems with the data. And so coming into the pandemic period and today, we have to say that you know, with all the caveats uh, Scott and Maya are including, there's really nothing reliable in Chinese GDP accounting today. To, that we can confidently stand on. And while it would be great if investors who are the ones that have to make uh, you know, fiduciary decisions about millions, billions of dollars, whether it's, it's prudent to deploy it into China, it would be great if they could go to China every time they considered making a, an investment to travel around the country and see what things are actually <laughs> going on. That's not how the global economy works, and it's impossible. It's practically impossible to do that. And, you know, coming up with these proxies like nightlights, I mean, that has some promise for the future. But even the two snapshots um, that you guys are uh, showed us there, right, um, uh, one of them was a week before Chinese New Year, and the other was a couple of days after Chinese New Year. So that change in light pattern, and to me, like when I consider what the date was of Chinese New Year in 2020, is almost certainly to be explained um, by holiday effects and all these kind of con confounding factors. So, you know, even if I can be aware of that, I, I, I can't expect investors to be able to uh, think all that um, through. What finally, and then I look forward to um, uh, other folks' observations here. Um, you know, what, what at Rhodium, what I think what we find most predictive of how things are going is actually neither the physical nor the sentiment approaches, but credit dynamics. There's actually better, more reliable data on credit volumes and pricing than, the, than there is reliable information on physical activity or sentiment, both of which are highly uh, suspect in my opinion. Um, whereas there is pretty powerful information to be found in uh, credit market dynamics if you know how to use it. And that's what's given us the best ability to look ahead and anticipate um, how we think economic uh, performance is going to uh, play through up to a year or, in some cases, three years ahead of time, uh, such as in the case of the credit and credibility study, Scott, that we did with you also back in 2018 and ended up being ext extraordinarily accurate in predicting when the uh, real estate uh, 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 bubble was going to start to collapse um, like within a month. We called it, I think. So three years out. Anyway, look forward to my colleagues' comments and thank you for doing this work. Well, thank you, Dan. Super, super duper helpful. Uh, Anne, over to you. Thanks, Scott. So let's see. I, I, I think that which number you look at really depends a lot on what kind of thing you're looking for. 
Um, I would disagree with the idea that in the past, China was was growing so much that nobody really cared. I think that that's true, that that's what happened, but I don't think it was necessarily a good idea. And therefore, you find a lot of particularly consumer products companies and luxury companies that are now uh, international companies, as well as domestic companies that are now overinvested in tier three, tier four cities because they thought that this uh, this this growth was just unbridled, and that that the growth was was due to economic growth rather than to uh, capital investment. I think that there are fundamentally two problems with uh, with China's statistics, and I don't think it particularly matters the capability of the statisticians, which I think is you know we can all agree is very high. Um, I think there are two problems. One problem is that it's not their job to report data uh, without without uh, you know just this straight up report data their their job is to target a particular number and see whether the data can can be twisted a little bit to meet that number um, how that number is agreed upon is is a you know sort of complex issue and has something to do with uh, GDP growth but it's not the fundamental you know, the fundamental driver of GDP analysis is not to find the real number the the fundamental driver is is a target the second problem is that the rural economy is more or less left out uh, in a whole lot of areas uh, em employment consumption household wealth um, and every time a number is sort of uh, sort of sort of um, becomes becomes useful by mistake, uh, such as flow of funds accounting or something like that, then then it gets whisked away uh, because the the increasing gap between the rural and urban economies is uncomfortable. And also really the rural, the urban economy is the only one that's of of real interest to uh, China. China's bureaucracy and statisticians. So within these problems, you get nested all sorts of other problems. One of them is, is uh, bureaucratic conflict. So in real estate numbers in particular, you have uh, two, two different streams of, uh, of data that are reported. One comes from uh, state-owned companies and another one comes from localities. And those two streams of data are totally different. And the localities have, uh, have all sorts of incentives to distort and, and misreport, as, as everybody does. Um, and you find that in uh, in consumption numbers, in um, in retail sales, in a whole lot of different areas. Um, so I think that the um, you know obviously I haven't I haven't studied uh, GDP in other countries, but I do find or suspect that GDP top line numbers in China are uh, whether accurate or inaccurate, uh, less useful to investors uh, because, because they're much more based on urban uh, investment than on, uh, on, on, on measures of real uh, wealth or well-being. Um, and so, you know, maybe wealth and well-being doesn't really matter if your building's, let's say, an ethylene cracker, if you're building a, a, a set of uh, retail stores to sell coffee, then uh, it really does matter. Um, and I've got lots more that I can always say, but let's stop there. That's super helpful. Um, I'm going to reveal a little secret here right now, which is uh, one of the reasons we want to do this project is because of a dinner that I had in Beijing last September uh, when I was at Beida giving a talk uh, about some research that we did. Uh, uh, Yao Yang was kind enough to host the talk uh, and the gathering. And it's not his fault that we got down this pathway, but he was a facilitator of us thinking about this issue and really appreciate uh, your, your good offices uh, for helping us interact with people in China, understand what's going on, uh, really uh, value uh, your views and look forward to your comments today, Yao Yang. Over to you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, first of all, I really want to congratulate uh, you and your team uh, uh, finishing this uh, wonderful research. Um, I think you have uh, collected a lot of data and have made uh, useful comparisons uh, between the GDP uh, figures and other figures. Um, my sense is that uh, Particularly by looking at uh, your figures, uh, 
uh, data quality is improving, uh, particularly when we compare COVID period and the 2014, 2015, uh, we see much more, you know, the, the, the official data are much more aligned with other indicators, right? uh, particularly the Li Keqiang Index. Uh, actually, in 2014, 2015, I had a huge doubt about the official data because uh, I looked at uh, the Keqiang Index. Uh, there were huge discrepancies between the official numbers and the index. Right? Uh, now we see more alignment uh, between official data and the Li Keqiang Index. Right? So that's a, a good sign. Uh, I think uh, the major cause is that uh, uh, the central leaders uh, now emphasize more on data quality uh, that started uh, from several years ago um, when the top leaders uh, realized uh, there were manipulations at the local level, uh, particularly with you know, Tianjin you know, and the Liaoning, right? So there, and uh, in the Mongolia, uh, those are three, three places that uh, revive down the GDP quite a lot, particularly uh, uh, Tianjin. By official number, Tianjin used to be the richest city uh, in China, right? But that was impossible. Uh, everyone knew it. But now the uh, Tianjin numbers uh, are more or less uh, correct. Right? So, I think that's uh, the most important reason. Uh, central leaders uh, demand for higher quality uh, statistics. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, we cannot rule out uh, manipulation uh, from local levels, uh, particularly uh, this year, uh, right? Um, and possibly in last year when the economy was uh, uh, kind of in a downturn. Right? So local leaders are still have simple uh, limited data. Uh, so in this case, uh, probably other indicators uh, are useful uh, to gauge uh, the real numbers uh, in China. I mean, I have talked with uh, those uh, so-called market economists. And they look at the official data, but in the meantime, they also look at the high frequency uh, data. Right? Uh, so with those data, uh, they try to reach a kind of uh, uh, so-called correct estimate for China's GDP growth. Uh, but at the macro level, uh, I still believe the Li Keqiang Index is still useful. Uh, if you look at the, the consumption in electricity, uh, with some adjustment like uh, today, right? The consumption of electricity is really high because it's so hot that people use uh, uh, air conditioners. Okay. But overall, uh, I still believe the Keqiang Index uh, is a useful uh, index. Uh, to estimate uh, real growth in China. I, I don't know if uh, uh, night nights uh, are reliable. There is a, a paper published in AER, uh, you know, using uh, light uh, data uh, to estimate uh, over report of uh, GDP numbers. And of course, the paper found uh, in non democracy uh, uh, there is a, a larger uh, overstay, uh, over-reporting of the GDP data. But uh, for us, um, uh, we actually don't believe uh, in the uh, light data a lot uh, because, you know, a lot of variations uh, right, in the uh, area, like uh, the hours uh, you, right, uh, for the satellite image, and, and the other things, right? uh, putting together, you know, we actually don't uh, find the light data uh, kind of accurate or reflected to, uh, local growth. Okay, let me stop here. Terrific, thank you so much.
uh, wonderful comments from from all of you. I think now uh, CSAS can put us all up on the screen the fo uh, for a, a group discussion, and uh, really appreciate the comments that that everybody everybody gave. So I want to ask a little bit more about a few things. One is about proxies. One is about not is about efficiency, uh, and and then also about data collection. Uh, the audience has been submitting questions online and sending them uh, to me. Uh, I want to thank my my team. In addition to Maya doing the research, uh, Matt Brokus, our program coordinator, uh, and others at CSIS who've helped. And again, thanks to to to, to Sky and and Scott Rosell. Um, so. I guess the first thing I want to go back to is is uh, the alternative metrics, and and Dan mentioned credit, uh, Yao Yang, the Li Keqiang index. Uh, I didn't think I heard from Anne yet what her alternative favorite metrics might be, but I'd be curious, maybe Anne, if you could start uh, ex uh, with other types of numbers that you go to. Uh, and then maybe if Dan and Yao Yang could explain why they rely on this, the type of things that they did mention already or things that they don't uh, rely on. So, Anne? Uh, I would say that uh, that that I, I prefer data sets that come from uh, independent organizations such as MySteel or Usteel, if Usteel still, still exists. Um, I like uh, high frequency data. On the top level, I look at um, at, at road freight. Um, I think that rail freight is of limited value because there's been such a shift toward uh, trucking from, from trains over the last 20 years, really, um, a very dramatic shift over 20 years. So I look at, um, at, at road freight, I look at passenger traffic, um, and and I think Dan is correct that uh, that credit is a good you know you want to look at numbers that um, uh, that come from the government because the government has more uh, ability to collect those and in China bank credit is ninety percent of investment uh, unlike other economies where it comes from you know bonds and equity investment and you know all sorts of private capital in china it's 90 percent from the banks so you can pretty much look at the banks and see how much credit they're issuing and uh, understand a lot about the economy that's helpful so, so dan maybe you could go into a little bit more about uh, bank credit you know as a as a measure of of where you think things really are is, is is it again because of the comprehensiveness as Anne just mentioned in terms of its dominance in the financial system? Um, I mean, I think a lot of people outside the economics world think that China doesn't have, uh, you know, genuinely commercial banking. And so the amount of credit that companies use um, only reflects maybe government incentives or, and then maybe they don't have to pay back their loans. So, uh, Tell us why, if you maybe in a little more detail, why credit is such a valuable tool to understand where you think China's economy is going. Mm. Well, first of all, it's important because it is the predominant factor input that determines China's overall growth and performance. This is an investment led system, make no mistake about it, right? And it has been for a very long time. And there are other considerations in the mix in the aggregate demographic dividends in the past and the end of those dividends today is a big consideration, right? And it relates to investment, but inv investment as a factor input in the growth equation, right, is the independent variable, <laughs> really, in making sense out of what's what's happening there, I think. And it explains the difference between China and, say, India or Nigeria and other developing countries over the years. China's ability through a command and control a political economy to um, uh, amass, well, to create capital formation and to direct where it's going, right? That that explains China's growth to a considerable extent. Uh, but in terms of what you know, we think is most valuable in looking at um, to to kind of to understand what government's intention is in terms of economic outcomes, you have to yes, look at bank credit because bank credit is such a large value and it is determined by government policy, right? Which sets 
rates for bank credit, but to get a sense of productivity in the economy and thus um, the ability and with the other big variable in the growth equation, right? Total factor productivity, that residual, you don't want to look at bank credit because bank credit is, as I said, as we know, basically determined by government rate setting, right? Um, instead, we look at non-bank uh, credit of all sorts and types, shadow banking uh, credits, um, uh, bankers' uh, acceptances. There, there's a wide variety of um, different markets for credit, money, and swaps, and all sorts of things outside of normal commercial banking uh, channels. And for those alter those other kinds of credit, there is data available. And that data is actually much more interesting and reflective of short-term conditions, high-frequency conditions, than the bank uh, lending rates are and the aggregates in the banking system are. And so if you really want to see if there's a, a squeeze on money or if uh, suddenly people are losing, changing their their confidence in staying, keeping their money in. Like if people start to think that the renminbi has nowhere to go but down against the U.S. dollar, as has happened this year to date, you see that show up in various prices as people try to find ways to move out of renminbi exposure into dollar exposure, right? And that is visible to us in credit um, data of various sorts. And it tells us something really powerful about which of these competing narratives that the world wants to go long China versus the world, as Ann said, is a little overinvested and wants to hedge back on that China exposure a bit. That is that that's not something that is obscured <laughs> to people in the market to know how to um, track that sort of thing. So it's a powerful, very very powerful lens on what's what's really happening. Yeah. Let me get Yao Yang's take on this, and then also Yao Yang, since you mentioned the Li Keqiang index, we we know that. Li Keqiang index measures uh, industry and and commerce uh, production, uh, but not services activities. And apparently, services activity is a increasing part of China's economy. Yet you see greater alignment recently in that the data that Maya showed uh, did. So, is it ironic that the Li Keqiang index is more closely aligned with macro trends, even though? Uh, the things that it measures are a decreasing share of the economy? Um, uh, first of all, you see, the, the, the two, two uh, index uh, out of the, the Keqiang index, uh, uh, one is electricity, the other one is uh, fruit uh, volume. Yes. They are connected by uh, different uh, agencies, right? uh, they're not collected by MBS. Uh, electricity actually is reported by the national grid, okay, or the, co -co, the state grid. Uh, transportation is collected by the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, I don't think uh, there is a coordination among those government agencies. So if, if you want uh, to really gauge the accuracy of MBS data, you know, you want to use data from different sources, okay? So that's why I believe uh, the Keqiang Index uh, is a good uh, indicator. But I want to uh, give uh, some caveats uh, to bank loans. Uh, you know, when the economy is good, uh, bank loans are probably a, a good indicator for economic growth in China. But when time is bad, like today, Bank loans probably are not a good indicator uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, SOEs uh, get a lot of uh, bank credits, and uh, SOEs uh, don't invest all their uh, uh, capital on, on, on loans. Uh, uh, they actually divert, uh, you know, money obtained from the bank uh, to other financial activities. So uh, when things are bad, uh, you see financial resources, bank loans uh, are circulating just among financial institutions. That's one. Another one is uh, local governments. Uh, local governments uh, through their financial companies, uh, like uh, local uh, financial vehicles, borrow heavily from banks. And when things are bad, uh, 
uh, local governments can easily divert uh, bank loans uh, for consumption, not for investment, like today, I believe. Right? Uh, how big uh, is the share? No one knows. Right? But uh, when you talk uh, privately with uh, government officials, they're going to tell you. Right? So when things are bad, bank loans uh, are not uh, a good indicator. I think a much better indicator, if uh, I were to reconstruct the Kaja index, I'm going to uh, replace bank loans uh, by uh, uh, housing sales. Uh, that's actually more accurate. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Um, and let's go to uh, Maya. Since you collected a bunch of this data for us, um, you looked at all these different metrics. What stand what stands out to you as a useful way to understand the trajectory of China's economy? Um, so um, I think they're all like very important, but my personal favorite has to be PMI. Um, one, it reflects the sentiment. Uh, and then the enterprise's business performance it also kind of um, allows you to look into private enterprise business business decision as well. Um, and then it's more like a leading um, index because it's um, it's monthly, and then it can show a timely changes in um, the business conditions and the business environment because uh, uh, it covers like new orders, inventory, production, supply, supply, employment. It's like a very broad, comprehensive um, uh, information that they collect. And also uh, PMI has a service sector version, which is very valuable since there aren't that many good metrics for the service sector. So, um, and then also you get the official PMIs and then the Caixin PMIs, they cover different kinds of um, companies, but to, uh, when you look at them together, I think they provide very uh, useful information. Thanks a bunch. Hey, let me ask two final questions because we're running up uh, close to the hour here. Um, and these are two very different ones and folks feel free to pick whichever question that, that you want to uh, as as uh, part of your your closing uh, reactions to, to today's discussion. The first is we've talked about measuring economic growth, uh, but for economists, oftentimes what's less what's more important than economic growth is productivity is whether growth is achieved just by throwing more stuff at stuff or whether you're more efficient total factor productivity. And I, you know, China doesn't clearly report total factor productivity data. Um, and we're not sure how efficient China's economy is. You, you can look at a variety of different metrics and, and it seems to be uh, that pro productivity is now almost irrelevant to Chinese growth based on um, certain kinds of, of, of data. Uh, so, how to crack the productivity nut to understand whether it's just more investment or whether we're seeing greater productivity in terms of the use of capital or Chinese workers. Second question is, uh, China just recently issued, uh, you know, uh, some new laws uh, related to uh, collecting data analysis, the counter espionage law. Uh, everybody knows that the environment in China is is seems to be more restrictive uh, than it used to be. Is it going to be harder for us going forward to collect the type of data necessary to understand the trajectory of China's economy, or is it it already the genie out of the bottle and we've got the credit data and other types of things and we we shouldn't expect it to be more difficult. Um, you know, where, how worried are you about uh, jo your jobs as economists to tell the story of where China is going? So productivity uh, and uh, doing research, collecting data. Uh, feel free to, to take either of these two. Uh, maybe we'll start with, with Anne, and then why don't we start, then we'll go to Yao Yang and then end with Dan Rosen. Gosh, I'm the least qualified to answer this. This is why, though, I like the uh, the 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 bank credit numbers and the official GDP number because I think you just take a proportion between those two things and you look at productivity. There are economists who do much, you know, very deep studies on total factor productivity, but 
as a very, very rough estimate, that's that's a decent one, and it shows a decline. Um, as for whether the numbers are becoming more or less reliable, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I I look at, at I, I do micro analysis of particular companies, and companies are having having trouble there. I think that the key issue is that you can no longer just ride into China on on the assumption that uh, investment is a great thing. Um, because the re you have to look at return on investment, not at gross numbers. Yao Yang? Um, first, I, I actually don't worry a lot about productivity. I uh, really don't believe many, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the outcomes of many studies, uh, right? Uh, because uh, over the last decades, uh, China has invested heavily into infrastructure, but much of the infrastructure is just a consumption to me, right? like, like a high-speed rail. High-speed rail does not create any uh, 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 production outputs, but it increased people's welfare tremendously. Uh, we economists uh, haven't invented the method to measure you know, welfare improvements out of uh, uh, high-speed rails. Uh, for your uh, sec second question, um, you know, much of the statistics uh, are published uh, by uh, the Chinese uh, official agencies, right? Uh, usually we just uh, get data out of like a PBOC, Ministry of Finance, uh, you know, uh, Ministry of Transportation, you just name it. Uh, so I don't think uh, the law is going to affect the data analysis, at least the data analysis, macro analysis in China. Dan, you get the final word. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. It's such a good discussion. Um, look, I think um, that most importantly for the next phase of China's growth going forward, I think we all uh, agree that we're at a turning point beyond which um, a lot of growth as we've known it can't be taken for granted any longer. It is crucial for China that it have the best possible understanding of its own GDP performance so that better policy choices can be made. And they're gonna be really hard ones that are very different than the kind of choices that had to be made in the past. Equally crucial to the rest of the world where I can say with confidence that governments I speak to in Germany, in Brussels, in Paris, in Tokyo, in uh, in Washington, in Canberra, elsewhere, are really, really concerned about whether they have uh, enough accurate GDP information to make their policies based on economics, not just based on security and political considerations of uncertainty. And so this is really important. Good news is China, I think, uh, has a terrific bunch of national income economists and professionals who are up to the job uh, once there's political room for them to uh, put put data back in charge uh, of the narrative. Well, today, uh, Secretary of the Treasury from the United States, Janet Yellen, is, is on her way to Beijing. And she's going to be talking with the Chinese uh, about a lot of different issues, uh, uh, the trajectory of the global economy, uh, debt relief in developing countries, climate finance, a bunch of things. One hopes that perhaps the topic that we've discussed today about trying to really understand where China's economy is headed uh, overall and in different industries, et cetera, might be a part of the conversation. And just the uh, expanding diplomatic dialogue can also help uh, economists and others uh, better understand where China is going. It's in China's self-interest, I think, as Dan just said, as as the world's that we all have a much better, that we all have as clear an idea about where uh, China's economy is going as possible. I want to thank Anne, Dan, Yao Yang for uh, offering their feedback on our feature and this topic and the work that you all do every single day. To uh, Scott Rosell and his colleagues at Sky for the partnership on Big Data China and to Maya for her partnership on this feature. Uh, it's been great working with you all. With you, uh, we will be publishing the feature in the next few days to the rest of my team at CSIS and the trustee chair and at CSIS Central, the broadcast team who put together today's event. Thanks to all of you, wherever you are, uh, morning, afternoon, evening, 
Thank you for joining and everyone take care. Cheers. Thank you.